Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I welcome you all to this new course that is titled as Development Process and Social Movements in India. In this, we are offering 20 lectures, out of which the very first lecture which I am going to deliver today is on democratic processes and social movements in India, which will give you an overall picture of how the modern India emerged with the independence it got in 1947 and over a period of time how the institutions like the state, judiciary, the federal system, etc. have worked over a period of time. Through this lecture, we will try to take an overlook of the whole process of democratization of the Indian society, the working of different institutions in India and how the check and balance in India works within the larger framework of constitutionalism. This lecture will also try to figure out that how the politics in India has been so far explained and understood through different parameters and framework. We will try to also understand that how the unfolding of democratic processes in India have very close and direct link with what we call as institutional politics along with what we call as the social movement processes part of doing politics in India. This lecture will try to understand and interlink the whole framework of politics in diverse sense. It is not only about the institutional processes or the electoral politics, but this lecture will also try to understand and link that how the very nature of the state has shaped the politics in India, how the history of colonial movement also shapes the diverse standpoints to understand politics in India. We will also try to understand that how over a period of time the framework of understanding pol politics in India has shifted from the institutional perspective to the social movement perspectives. If we look into the overall overview of po understanding politics in Indian context and understanding the democratic processes in the Indian context, we find that the idea is to provide not merely an account of the major developments in politics and democracy in India, but also to provide frameworks for understanding these developments. Now this we need to keep in our mind that while undergoing this paper and more so in this lecture, this we are not going to offer only the events or incidents or the key developments in the history of politics in India in the post-independent phase, but we are also try to understand those events and processes of development of politics in India through the processes itself and the different methods or approaches through which those developments can be explained or can be understood. We all know that the enduring debates in the study of Indian politics are largely driven around two fundamental frameworks. One is what we call as the institutional understanding of making sense of politics in India. The other important aspect of it is in terms of the social movement perspective or social movement aspects. When we say that understanding politics through institutional framework, it precisely means that we are trying to decode the working of different institutions which are provided through the constitution of India and how those institutions came into picture, how they have evolved over a period of time. For instance, how judiciary evolved in 1950s and has changed its role with the changing pattern of politics in India. Similarly, on the other hand, if you look into the other standpoint of understanding politics in India, that is the social movement part or in other words, we can say the democratic processes part, then we need to understand the political processes in India through the activism on the ground or through the people's involvement or citizens response to different issues within the Indian politics. 
and thus we will keep in mind that these two different standpoints that is the institutional framework of understanding politics in india as well as the social movement or activism part of understanding politics in india moving to the broad commitment to the institutions of democracy but also the deeper contestations and thus constitutional provisions deeply respected while processes questioned now this is very interesting aspect of politics in india and the understanding of it that while on the one hand we find that there is a broad commitment to the institutions of democracy in india and except the two years of emergency from 1975 to 1977 we largely find that our commitment and our respect towards the democratic institutions in india are intact but on the other hand we also find that if the constitutional provisions are respected in the same vein the when it comes to the process part of it those processes are always questioned and they have been re-examined in the light of changing demands and aspirations of the common people. It is in this context that a few questions become very pertinent and we need to discuss them in detail. Some of the key questions we will try to figure out in this lecture are following. One, what are the major dimensions of the changes in Indian polity in seven decades? Now this question is very important to understand the shift in politics in India. When I am saying that there is a shift in politics in India, we need to understand that not only the way the new institutions have emerged over a period of time in India or that how the very nature and functioning of those institutions have shifted or changed over a period of time in India. But also important, it is important to understand that how those who participate in the political processes whom we call as political actors, both the political leaders, the political elites as well as the common people or the masses as well as at different interest groups, then we find that all of these have changed their role over a period of time. Their commitment towards politics has moved, has developed and has matured over a period of time. And if we do not understand this shift or this change over the last seven decades or more, then we will not be able to understand the democratic processes in India. Another important question in this respect is that what are the broad frameworks of engagement with the political processes in India? Now this question again becomes important that what are the frameworks we are going to use to make sense of political processes or democratic processes in India? When I am saying that there are different frameworks to understand politics in India, actually I am trying to highlight that whether we are going to make sense of politics in India only through understanding the institutions part of it or whether we are going to also make sense of politics in India through diverse other perspectives or standpoints including that how the political economy of this country works or how the different movements have responded to the political elites different decisions at different decades. Similarly, how the common people have responded to the changing role of judiciary or of the election commissions, then we need to understand that how the political process or the democratic processes in India have evolved. When we try to figure out the answers to these questions, it lies somewhere in between the two dominant framework of understanding politics in India. And as I have already mentioned, that those two dominant framework of understanding politics in India are broadly the institutional and the social movement part. If we have to have the balanced understanding of under politics in India, then we need to draw somewhere a fine balance between the two. And the reason as to why we need to have some kind of fine balance to understand the politics in India is very specific and it is that the politics in India has evolved over a period of time precisely under the influence of what we call as Indian National Movement. We all know that Indian National Movement provided that framework or platform through which different ideas were contested, different ideas were debated, be it the social inequalities or economic exploitations or political liberty, all of these ideas were part of it were imported through the British Empire and British colonialism, but also those ideas were challenged and new fresh ideas were infused into them through various debates and discussions in 19th 
century and early 20th century. If we will not keep an eye on those movement parts of during the Indian national movement or the inputs which the Indian politics gained from those movements, then we will not be able to figure out that how best to understand politics in India and the democratic processes in India. If we look into this issue of what we call as democracy in India, then we have to keep in mind that the very framework or the very idea of what we call as Jantantra or democracy, it has deep roots and very deep sense. That understanding or that idea of democracy in India goes back to ancient times too. The whole idea of Samitis or Sabhas as I will discuss in some other lecture in detail about this, they were very crucial in terms of establishing the fact that how at some point of time we had that sense that representation of people can be ensured through a select people or set of people who have entrusted with this confidence that they can voice their concerns. And it is this very primary understanding of representation of people's voice through a selected few that took part in the ancient India through the conceptions of Sabhas and Samitis. And thus, the very notion of Gantantra or what we call as in the modern times as Republic, we had even the glimpses of those Gantants or Republics in ancient India and through which we find that the very functioning of or the understanding of delegation of power, very understanding of working of a government for the people and by the people, both of these ideas were very much in currency during the ancient time. In addition to that, the notion of panchayats and the framework of Gram Sabhas, they were also very intact and had very deep rooted roots in the collective psyche. Even now, you talk to people in the villages, they always refer back to the conception of panchayat when they have to resolve any issues. Similarly, if you look into the Jatak stories or Panchatantra stories, we find that the references of panchayats are very much there and that is proved again and again that we had certain sense of institutionalized manner of resolving the tensions or resolving the problems of our society. We all know that the modern framework of democracy precisely does that, that is that it provides the institutional framework for resolving the tensions or crisis or the contestations in the society. Thus, if one need to understand that why democracy works in India or how democracy is so successful in India despite all limitations, then we need to have very open mind towards our own past and towards our own historical basis of the very collective understanding or collective psyche towards and the positive approach towards the understanding and the framework of democracy. One can say that even at the subconscious level in our mind that these conceptions of working of democratic principles are deeply involved and thus it becomes very easy for us to adjust with the modern democratic frameworks as it has been imported through the British colonialism. If you look into the, as I have mentioned, some of the texts from ancient India including Vidurniti, Panchatantra, Jatak stories and many other oral traditions which discuss and examine fundamental questions of notions of ethics and morality so central to idea of democratic politics. We all know that when we talk about the democratic politics, we are basically dealing with a certain ethical questions certain moral frameworks within which a politics is supposed to be done. When we talk about those ethical principles and moral frameworks, we find that the references of those ethical questions are clearly there in some of the ancient texts including Vidurniti, Mahabharata as well as in Jatak stories and Panchatantra. When we decipher or decode those ethical issues, we find that those fundamental questions are dealt in detail and satisfactory answers can also be located through those stories. In addition, the very basic conception of the state is dealt and discussed in detail through some of the key texts of ancient times and thus it becomes very important for us to keep an eye over those texts and must engage with those texts in modern times in our contemporary times so that we can make sense of the contemporary politics in India.
If we go through across India, you find that various traditions of democratic theories and practices are present. These stories, these texts, they are not concentrated or available only one part of India. You go across India, you find from north to south and east to west that multiple texts with multiple interpretations of the same stories or various stories are available in the collective consciousness of people. We need to collect those collective consciousness and we need to make sense of those stories through the collect understanding in the collective consciousness. If we try to figure out or frame this whole question or issue of democracy in our times, that is the contemporary times, we find that the meaning or sense of democracy in our present context can only be explained if we also link the idea of democracy with the colonial past. We cannot explain the democratic processes in India and the social movements in our time without linking it necessarily with the way politics transpired during the colonial period. The very idea of modern liberal framework of democracy as it was experienced through colonial subjugation contributed significantly into the understanding of politics in India as it is today. Can we ignore the fact that the very idea of constitutionalism and constitutional morality, the very framework or idea of liberty, equality, justice and fraternity as it has been envisaged in the preamble of the constitution can be explained without the deep discussions and engagement with these concepts which were there during the India's freedom struggle. Whether it is Congress sessions at different point of time, the different resolutions which were passed at different stages and in different decades or the contribution of different political leaders from different ideological positions who constantly engaged with the possibilities of exploring a bright future for India even during the dark days of colonial encounter that those engagements and those contributions significantly helped India in terms of figuring out that what will be its future post-independence. And it is in this context that to keep an eye and understand the colonial past is very important to understand the politics in our modern times. Similarly, the modern parliamentary system as it evolved through those experiences in the colonial past are very significant and important. In one of the chapters in this course, where we will try to understand the whole system of parliament in India, we will see that how the parliamentary system in India evolved through different acts at different points of time in 19th century and early 20th century. Here I am just giving you a passing reference that even the parliamentary democracy in India as it has been established through the constitution has actually the deep roots in our encounter with the British colonialism. Interestingly, the resistance against the colonial encounter developed the strong sense of democratic engagement in the language of resistance and thus continuing impact of it in the post-independent India. Now this third point is again very important to make sense of that it is not only about that those concepts or categories which we use in our constitutional framework of doing politics that they are important or that we imported whole lot of institutions and ideas in the form of parliamentary democracy from Britain. In addition to that, what contributes significantly to our democratic polity in the post-independent India was the kind of engagement in terms of protest against those concepts were there during the colonial encounter. And it is because of those resistance towards these concepts and conceptions at it have, as it was or those concepts were imported from the British Empire that we need to make sense of that how those concepts were refined and how those concepts were then sharpened in order to be used in the Indian context in a more broader sense. And here we can take the example of the way Ambedkar engaged with the concepts of liberty, equality and justice in order to figure out that how these concepts along with the same similar use of these concepts in Buddhism were imported and fused together to develop certain theories of social 
improvement of those who belong to certain castes or communities in India. And thus, we can say that the understanding of democratic politics in India needs to have deep understanding of colonial encounters. Thus, institutional democracy framework and social movements both simultaneously exist in the Indian context. Now, these two, as I have repeatedly argued in this lecture, that the understanding of institutional framework of India and in politics in India as well as the social movement as both simultaneously existing and shaping the overall democratic polity in India needs to be underlined. If we look into the seminal work done by Nirja Gopal Jayal and Pratap Bhanu Mehta in the form of their Oxford Companion to Politics in India, we find that following points are of importance. One, they argue that the premise of Indian democracy has always been that power needs to be divided among several institutions. Now, this is very crucial and important point they highlight in their work. That if you look into the larger framework of politics in India and the long duration analysis of India, it is very clear that Indian polity was always convinced with this idea that power should not be concentrated in one hand or in one institution. And thus, the very bedrock or basis of politics in India is in terms of separation of power or that power needs to be allocated in various institutions rather than in one institution. And it is because of this reason, even if uh, it appears that legislative and executive power are coterminous, then too we find that power in terms of judiciary or the check and balance is provided and judiciary is strong enough to check any kind of wrongdoings of legislative or executive arms. In addition, this thickest of institutions provides a series of checks and balances which ensures that the infirmities of one institution can be compensated for by the actions of another. And now it is in continuation of their first argument that they argue that even if it appears or in reality it is so that some of the institutions are not strong enough to contribute significantly to the democratization process in India, then there are other institutions available who take care of the situations and thus they ensure that the social upliftment of people can be taken care of even if the some of the institutions are failing or not being able to meet the demand of polity. Another important aspect is that the large number of institutions democratic setup like India also poses a special challenge. While talking about the basic characteristic or nature of democratic polity in India in contemporary times, Jayal and Pratap Bhanu Mehta also highlight two important concerns or questions of our time which needs to be addressed and they are following. First, how will the boundaries of power between them be defined? Now, this is very important and crucial question within the democratic politics in India that when different institutions have different powers, how the power has been distributed among those different institutions and how the balance between those different institutions has been managed. Another important question in this regard is, will not each institution compete to secure more and more space for itself? And now this question is very contemporary and we need to understand this question in light of some of the recent tensions between the legislative or executive and judiciary on the other hand. Time and again this question has been raised that is it not that some of the institutions in India are trying to flex their muscles or that they are trying to build upon whatever is being provided to them through the constitutional framework. And it is in this context that again and again this question is asked that is it not that judiciary is trying to enter into the domain of legislative and executive bodies and it is in this context this question becomes very pertinent. Going into the next framework and that is the understanding of the institutional arrangements and contestations. Here it is important to underline that arguably Recent trends in Indian politics have only exacerbated the urgency of these questions and thus whatever has transpired in 1950s, 1960s and 1970s that those 
developments needs to be highlighted and understood then only we will be able to make sense of the recent developments in contemporary indian politics for example the division of authority between courts and the parliament has always been a matter of contestations now if you look into this relationship between the parliament and judiciary 1960s onwards you will find that time and again there has always been the attempt by the judiciary to claim and reclaim its within court just position within this balance of power and check and balance system on the other hand parliament has not lost any opportunity to reassert and reclaim its own valid standpoint regarding that who is supreme and it is in this contestations that again and again democratic politics in india worked as a bulwark to ensure that there is a fine balance between the two this contestation thus in terms of the institutional arrangements and balance of power this contest has extended not only to claims to be supreme arbiter of the constitution it now extends to issues of governance as well now this is interesting aspect of democratic politics in contemporary india that this whole issue of balancing of power or as to who is supreme when it comes to the constitutional framework or interpretation of constitution or the changes to be made in the constitution that if on the one hand judiciary is claiming that its position is valid on the other hand parliament is trying to assert its own position we find that in between this that issue of governance has also now started emerging and thus the there is no limit to judiciary's claim in terms of only as an interpreter of the constitution its claim has now extended beyond this constitutional framework to even enter into the domain of governance and thus we find that even small issues are there in which the supreme court or the judiciary is intervening at the level of policy decision making as to influence executive and legislature idea of democracy suffuses almost everything that is central to indian political experiences from its institutional arrangements and political processes to public policies and ideological contestations now this shows and gives us the broader framework of understanding the democratic politics in india that the very basic idea of democracy is suffused with and is central to the very experience of what we call as indian politics thus the very framework of understanding politics in india needs to have this recognition that the centrality of democracy cannot be ignored and this centrality of democracy is both in the institutional arrangements as well as in the political processes and thus from public policies to ideological contestations the centrality of democracy is always being established now within this framework of understanding democratic politics in india and the institutional and social processes component of it we find that it has two vantage points or two different strands and they can be considered in terms of what we call the analytical and substantive aspect of understanding democracy in india now if you try to make sense of frame the whole issue of democracy in india you need to have two different tangents or two different vantage points one is what we call the analytical implications of understanding democracy in india that is that we need to have the study of institutions and that will remain absolutely central to understanding indian politics so if you make sense of indian politics analytical vantage point or analytical framework analytical implications then you find that within this framework the studies of institutions are necessary and sufficient to make sense of the overall political processes in india on the other hand the substantive implications of understanding politics in india in terms of understanding the politics of checks and balances and there then you need to have very open ended framework or understanding of politics in the indian context and there the checks and balances or needs to be not only limited to understanding the institutional checks and balances but also the democratic processes of checks and balances in the form of social movements and 
activism by even the non-governmental organizations. In this regard, following two pertinent questions are need to be highlighted. One, what is the capacity of this democracy to create a sense of national identity without conflict? Now, this question needs to be elaborated further. Do you think that the very framework or understanding of democracy in India is a strong enough to continue to have the unity of the nation without necessarily challenging it? In other words, do you think that the democratic processes in India through social movements can contribute significantly in the unity of India without necessarily harming its interest? The second important question that what is its capacity to manage social tensions arising out of the process development? Now, second question actually comes from the first only that how capable is democratic process or democracy in India in terms of managing the social tensions which emerge due to the developmental discourse or the process of development. Do you think that the state in India is efficient enough to manage those social tensions in India which are necessarily the outcome of the kind of economic developmental projects which India has decided for itself along with some of the social measures for instance reservations and how that different communities and different sections of the society have continued to have the trust in the modern Indian democratic setup despite some of the measures which are not necessarily satisfying certain groups. While trying to answer these questions, we will see that how at the different phases and the different decades, the modern state, modern Indian state through democratic processes has managed to uh, develop certain kind of balance among different contesting positions. And here then the question becomes very important that how one does think about democracy in India. If we go by what Jayal and Mehta argue in their work that India does well on most other measures of success in a democracy including. Now, this is important that Jayal and Mehta both of them have underlined that how India has done so well over a period of time in within the democratic frameworks and when it comes to counting those issues on which the Indian democracy has succeeded. The first important thing we need to keep in mind is and that is a very important parameter in terms of uh, deciding that how liberal democracy in India is so successful and it is in the form of voters turnout. The second important indicator of the success of democracy in India and one's commitment towards the democratic politics in India is in terms of turnover of incumbents that many of those who are winning the elections they have the trust, the people have the trust in terms of that they are returning to power and even at times there is this issue where people think or the citizens or the voters think that the sitting government is not performing or the sitting representative is not performing that they have been rejected in the subsequent elections. Similarly, the empowering of new groups. If you look into the politics in the decades of 1950s and 60s and can see the dominance of particular caste group or particular communities over the politics in India or particular political party over the political processes in India, then you find that by 1960s and 70s, the story started changing and by 90s, the story completely shifted in North India and it threw new political leadership, new political elites, new political parties and new political class including new social class and caste groups into the political processes and that is how you find that the whole dynamics of politics transformed in 1980s and 90s and that is how if we think about democracy in India, we find that the empowering of new groups is very essential and core of democratic development in India in last 7 decades. Moving to the next, the maintaining of core set of liberal freedom has been intact in the Indian context and thus when it comes to individuals liberty, when it comes to some of the fundamentals of modern liberal framework of politics, then there has been no doubt or contestations over it. And thus the basic minimum equality in the society, non-exploitation of the caste groups, the 
equal treatment of all the communities by the state or the principles of secularism all of these ideas have been though debated but been never challenged fundamentally and there is a large acceptance among the society on those in addition the civilian control over armed forces is something which has been established again and again in different decades and under different governments and there has never been any doubt that india can have any kind of military authoritarian government at any point of time similarly the political contestation in india has been always the culture and part and parcel of democratic politics in india and thus it continued for more than seven decades and is still people pay due respect to the political contestations and has never been challenged if we look into the democracy in india as much of an established fact as its success is a matter of surprise to political scientists now this is something one need to understand that it is easier to argue that well india has a successful democracy in terms of all the institutions functioning well or that there are voices to be heard and people have freedom to come on roads or to voice their concerns and they can contest the positions of different institutions or of government or that there is a robust mechanism of opposition within the parliamentary democracy in india despite all this also true is the fact that the indian democracy has faced many challenges and those challenges were something which we received or got historically because of social inequalities in the indian context or because of the religious diversities or because of our colonial encounter along with that the kind of exploitation economic exploitation uh, the country suffered during the colonial encounter we need to keep in mind that poverty illiteracy backwardness all of these were inherent part of the 1947 independence despite all that the fact is that the democracy in india has survived and that leads to surprises among the political scientists as to understand and explain that how india managed to do that and it is in the process of exploring the answer to this question that we find that the explanatory reason of democracy in india is that it is not permitted on a single interpretive or explanatory framework within which to think about indian democracy possibly there where i think lies the strength in terms of explaining as to why democracy in india has succeeded and contributed so significantly in our understanding and the reason is simple that there is no one singular explanatory framework through which you can explain or talk about the success of democracy in india democracy in india has in fact survived for so long for multiple reasons and institutional arrangements is just one social movement processes the historical past the ancient collective psyche of people to the cultural ethos of india whole lot of things have contributed significantly the kind of political leadership which emerged during the india's freedom struggle and in the subsequent decades our openness towards new ideas our openness towards this understanding that the social inequalities in india needs to be examined and needs to be questioned and erased that's how india has constantly challenged its own framework or its own understanding and evolved a new framework in order to make politics in india more meaningful rather than looking for a single theory explaining indian democracy the focus should be on examine the myriad mechanisms by which democracy has been sustained and as i have talked about and explained this so i'll not go into the detail that why it is needed that we should not focus only on one explanation as to why democracy in india has worked for so long but we need to go beyond it and understand the whole lot of mechanisms which are involved in the successful unfolding of democratic processes in india and it is in this context that the narratives of indian democracy in various forms needs to be underlined rather than just emphasizing one or two variables we cannot just say that it is because of the politicization of the caste that the democracy in india has survived for so long or we cannot just hold on to the fact that judiciary in india is so active our judicial activism in india has led to rescuing 
democracy for so long. Actually, if you look into the different decades of politics in India, you find that at different point of time, different sorts of challenges were there, be it the secessionist movement of 1980s in the form of Khalistan or the kind of food crisis which were there in 1960s and when Indian farmers got into this green revolution to contribute significantly to raising the food crop in India or when it comes to the unstable formations of government in the decade of 1990s then you find that suddenly the coalition governments having the stable five years terms also for almost two decades and that is how the Indian democracy has responded time and again with adjustments and readjustments and trying to reconfigure the available resources to make democracy work in Indian context. And this indicate the extent to which whole host of factors from the colonial legacy to the character of India's inherited institutions, from the beliefs of its leaders to the character of social divisions interact with each other to sustain democratic institutions. And thus, now it is important to understand that all of these points which I have just highlighted, that is the colonial legacy of the Indian state, the characters of India's inherited institutions in the form of judiciary, parliament, etc., the beliefs of its leaders and the character of the social divisions which are interacting with each other, all of them have contributed significantly in sustaining the democratic institutions in India. Coming to the specific question that what sustains democracy in India, then we need to keep in mind that if on the one hand politics is clearly shaped by the long term structural features of society, then on the other hand social hierarchies, economic possibilities, historical legacies influence the nature and character of political society. And thus one need to keep in mind that in the long term structural features of society, there are always the core of politics and that core of politics in the Indian context has always been that of a parliamentary representative democracy. But that does not mean that this is what explains the every other phenomena of political processes in India. In addition to what we call as the liberal parliamentary democratic representative form of government, in addition to that, the other factors which needs to be incorporated and explained are in the form of what we call as social hierarchies, the economic possibilities or the economic aspirations of the different sections of the society, the historical legacies that they all need to be brought into the explanatory framework of the Indian democratic politics. If we go into the long range influence influences which impact democracy in India, we also have to understand in turn modified by the working of democracy. Thus, if we just for instance pick only caste framework to understand politics in India, we also have to understand as Rajni Kothari has highlighted in his work that it is not only about that how caste influenced democratic politics in India, but we also need to make sense of and decode that how politics has influenced the whole caste framework. And thus, if on the one hand caste as an exploitative category has uh, played the detrimental role or played as a role of roadblock for democracy to progress in India, also is the fact that caste has modified itself under the pressure and influence of democracy and at times it has played some positive roles for communities to progress and to achieve and bargain with the state and it is in through this politicization of the caste that it has empowered a large section of people especially in states like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and thus we need to keep in mind that all these factors have very important or significant roles to play. For instance, the deep seated structures of social and economic inequalities have had a profound influence on the way in which Indian democracy has functioned and these deep seated structures of social and economic inequalities as I have talked about have always played significant role and we need to underline them and incorporate them in our analysis of understanding uh, political processes and democracy in India. But also is the fact that 
social movements have constantly challenged the dominant forces in the society and opened the possibilities of contesting the exploitative ideas. Now here, the importance of social movements become very important that if on the one hand institutional politics or the available institutions through democracy in India have provided lots of support to all those classes or the caste groups or the communities who otherwise felt exploited. On the other hand, also true is the fact that social movements at different points of time have sensitized the people and have also pushed the institutions to deliver maximum in terms of ensuring that the social classes are feeling confident about the working of these institutions. Caste, class, gender, ecological issues, farmers protest, all of these issues have evolved over a period of time and these are some of the new entries into the understanding of political processes in India. And thus, if you look into the contemporary politics in India, you find that all of these issues have been constantly debated and the new form of representing the concerns of the society have taken shape through these issues. Especially if you look into the ecological crisis or the environmental crisis in India and the way the democratic politics in India has constantly invoked the conception of right to life of article 21 to claim and reclaim that it is the responsibility of the state and other institutions including judiciary to ensure that we have safe environments in which we are living. Thus, these hierarchies have been modified and reconfigured in a democratic context. Indian democracy is also an ongoing exercise in political improvisation. Its trajectory has not been determined only by structural conditions, but has at each step been shaped by a number of contingent political choices. Now, this standpoint is very important to figure out the democratic politics in India. Democratic processes or democratic politics in India has constantly improvised. So, if you look into the functioning of democratic institutions in India in 1950s and 60s, they were largely concentrated or focused on delivering those policies which can ultimately contribute on two lines. One, in terms of ensuring that poor must be uplifted within the society and for that the whole project of modernization, the whole project of industrialization was introduced. On the other hand, we had the different uh, tangent at that point of time and that was in the form of ensuring social justice through the institutional framework of reservations. But if you look into the political improvisation in the 1960s and 70s, you suddenly find that the political institutions became sensitive towards delivering justice to the common people beyond these two parameters of poverty and caste whole lot of other issues including gender and environment became very important. The political processes in India and the institutions readjusted and reconfigured their dynamics in order to deliver on those lines which were now the new demands from the polity in the Indian democratic framework. It is often said that modern India is a creation of politics, arguably the same is true of Indian democracy. Now, this is undeniable truth that the if we have any conception of modern India that that modern India is actually the result of deep political processes which are involved in the Indian context. Similarly, if we look into and examine the very framework or understanding of democracy in India, that very framework of democracy in India too is deeply shaped by the very idea and issue of uh, doing politics in India and thus doing politics in India is very central to the dynamics of democratic upliftment of common people. If we establish this link between the Indian state and democracy in the Indian context, we find that the study of the state in India moved from the early accounts in which the inseparability of the political system from the Congress party was aptly captured in Rajni Kotari's term the Congress system to political economy perspective and which sought to explain the nature of Indian state in terms of dominant classes and social groups.
If you look into the studies in the Indian politics in 1950s and 60s, you find that the larger dominant perspective to understand democracy in India or politics in India was shaped by what Rajni Kothari called as the Congress system. That is the dominance of one particular party and even the opposition voices were within part of the larger Congress party system. But by late 1960s and early 1970s, you find that other perspectives started emerging and one of the dominant perspective was in terms of political economy Marxist perspective, which tried to figure out that how politics in India is largely shaped by the class struggle. But later on, late 1970s and early 1980s, you find that the works of Pranav Bardhan, Sudipta Kaviraj and Rudolf and Rudolf that they contributed in understanding the political processes in India in terms of focus on how powerful classes sought to control the state or on the relative autonomy or capacity of the state to negotiate with these groups. Moving on to the next understanding and that is what Rudolf had argued or talked about in the form of Bullock capitalists as Rudolf's description who successfully transformed their social dominance into political and economic power. Through all these conceptions and frameworks of understanding during the 70s and 80s, we had largely the framework of political economy to make sense of linkages between the Indian state and democratic polity. If you examine the changes in the recent times or the recent trends in this whole understanding or examining the role of the state and democracy in India, you find that state and classes are no longer confined to dominant classes and classes and class coalitions. Our understanding of state and democratic politics in India has gone beyond the class exploitation framework or class category framework of understanding or solely sticking decoding the caste politics in India will not be sufficient to make sense of Indian political processes. The emergence of the study of the subaltern groups in 1980s contributed significantly in the understanding of modern India and the contemporary India. When we say that what is this understanding of subaltern groups, it is precisely about the understanding of politics from below and thus so far till 1970s and 80s if we have the understanding of democratic politics in India in terms of how a state examines and looks into the societal divisions and societal fissures and how it tries to resolve those problems and tensions through institutions, then this new perspective which emerged in the form of subaltern perspective in the writings of Partha Chatterjee and others, we find that now the understanding of common people or the people at below or from below, how they are looking at the state and what is the sense or meaning of the state for them, then that understanding became important. And this contributed significantly in terms of completely reversing the gaze and making sense of political processes in India from below. And it is through this perspective or standpoint that the voices of the Dalits, voices of the Adivasis, voices of the women came into picture and they contributed significantly to our understanding of democratic politics and social processes in India. In the decade of 2000, the resource of anthropology in the writings of Partha Chatterjee and others and how the state is perceived and received and even desired that those writings became very significant to make sense of the new kinds of development which started taking place under the influence of liberalizations, privatizations and globalization. And it was during that point of time that the political processes in India were going significant change. The dominance of the Congress was of course falling down and it was also at that point of time that different sections of people and different caste groups, different communities, different Adivasi groups and women, they started reclaiming the, their space in the state politics as well as in the society. And it was at that point of time that certain writings tried to figure out that what is desirable in this democratic politics in India and how one can achieve it. If the earlier focus was on the state and high politics, later governmentalities, practices, the discourses not traditionally associated with doing politics, 
were examined and that's how we see that it was not only about understanding the political institutions in India or about only understanding the non-governmental organizations or social movements in India, but it also became very pertinent that how we make sense of the very location of power and power structure in the society and how that power and power structure in society contributes significantly in the understanding of political process in India that became very important. The state remains the overarching framework within which the oppositions between social classes are played out. Now, in this whole context of understanding politics in India in the decade of 2000 and in the recent times, what remains very important and central is that is still the understanding of or the overarching framework of a state remains very important and thus if the shift of the focus moved away from the institutions or away from social movement that does not mean that the role of the state was not examined. During the decades of 1990s and 2000, despite the withdrawal of the state from certain sectors of economic activities, outsourcing of welfare functions to non-governmental organizations as argued by Parth Chatterjee, the cliche about the separation between the state and non-state domains is not necessarily true and thus the state is significantly present. If we look into the recent developments, more so after post-2014, the centrality of the state in providing benefits to the poor has been reinforced and this reinforcing of the centrality of the state in the internal politics is something which is of great significance and we need to again uh, reconfigure or try to re-engage with this fact that how the role of the state in the political processes in India is so central. In addition to that, we also need to answer this question that why there is a return of the state or why the state is making a comeback. This big question becomes very important in the context of the fact that in the neoliberal economic framework, the state has very less role to play and that it is only supposed to play the role of an arbiter or an empire. Then in what context and in what circumstances the modern state is now playing so significant role in everyday lives of millions of people in India post 2014. And it is in this context that the earlier understanding of framework of understanding of interventionist state to regulatory state needs to be questioned as it was designed by Rudolf and Rudolf. Through the instrumentality of public interest litigation, if the Supreme Court has started playing some important role, then we also need to understand that is it not that the Supreme Court is overreaching its own capacity or power. Just because the court's interventions are popular, does this mean that we need to continue with this trend? Do we need to have certain kinds of more finer checks and balance? Similarly, the importance and the legitimacy of Election Commission of India has been established and re-established again and again. Uh, on the same vein, the role of federalism and how federalism has over a period of time significantly proved that there is a coordinated relationship between the center and the states and the aspirations of the regions are taken care of and that is how you find that federal structures, judiciary, election commissions, all these institutions have performed so well so far in the last more than seven decades. The party system in India has contributed significantly in the positive development in the same context. And it is in this context that we need to understand that democratic processes in India have so far successfully contributed and we need to continue with this whole understanding of both institutional politics as well as social movements of India to make sense of democratic politics in India. With this, I will end my lecture. I am sharing with you a few suggested reading. Those who wish to have more in-depth understanding of it, they may engage with it. Thank you.